Well, uh, good evening, everyone. It's a really great opportunity to have you all on the platform of uh, Google Meet and YouTube Live to participate in the second academic session of the international webinar on transforming disciplines, the impact of gender, jointly organized by the Internal Quality Assurance Cell and the Department of English, Hiralal Bhakut College, Nalati Birbhum. Uh, by gender, we do neither attempt to fix or focus on any specific gender, nor do we consider gender-related issues any way distinct from other sociocultural aspects which create quite prominent impacts on different disciplines and lead them towards evident transformations within specific temporal and spatial territories. Our venture is, in a way, a journey uh, towards an introspection into the heart of variegated gender-related uh, impacts on developments and uh, divergences within different disciplines. I am not at all a suitable person at the face of the eminent dignitaries uh, present among us uh, today to discuss the central topic of our webinar any further. Uh, hence, we would uh, evidently prefer to move ahead towards the uh, beginning of the session, academic session. Uh, we are really honored uh, to have among us uh, as speakers, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Shukla Banerjee, who will be uh, joining uh, very soon, I think. And uh, our second speaker with whom we'll be starting uh, this particular session is Dr. Shudeshna Mojumdar. She is an assistant professor, Department of English, Rampurat College. And she is working on partition and post-partition uh, Bangla literature for the last few years. And her paper, Landscapes of Substance, Exploring Post-Partition Bangla Mem Memoirs by Women, is evidently going to enlighten this specific domain of our introspection in this uh, particular venture, in this webinar. And uh, following that, uh, we will be having our third speaker, that is Professor Ruth Vanita, Professor, University of Montana, USA. Um, so uh, these are the three speakers we are having. And at the same time, I would like to thank Professor Shukla Basushen, former professor, Department of English, uh, Bishobharati, uh, for agreeing to coordinate this session in spite of her physical hazards. Uh, we were just discussing it uh, a, a few minutes before. Being one of my uh, favorite teachers, she actually couldn't uh, probably uh, refuse me. Uh, and I'm really sorry, uh, Shukladi, for putting this burden on you. And I'm assuring to uh, read out the queries and comments uh, from the chat box on your behalf during the interactions. Uh, I would like to request Shukladi to take charge of this session. And we, the organizers, we are always present uh, at the site for any kind of assistance. And uh, we hope that uh, this session will be a grand success. So uh, I'm uh, handing over to uh, Professor Shukla Basushan. Microphone to on for the Shukla. Shukla, the microphone to on for Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I think we'll have a very fruitful evening of academic discussion. And now since our second speaker, scheduled second speaker is now the first speaker of this session, I will now invite Dr. Shudeshna Mojumdar uh, to present her paper. And as we all know, uh, Shudeshna wears uh, a number of hats. She is a poet. She is a painter of a remarkable degree of efficiency and sensitivity. And of course, she is academically extremely sound, one of my favorite students when she was studying at Vishwam. And uh, she also shares a number of interests with me in the sense that I am interested in translation. She is also interested in translation in actually one of the first translation seminars held at our department on translating Indo-Anglian poetry into Bangla. We found that one poem uh, was translated by her. The same poem was translated by me and Professor Shongota Mondol cut it into half and uh, made quite a wonderful single poem out of the two translations. So that is one space we have shared in the past. 
and I really enjoy having her as a speaker. And as uh, Shuddha Shota has already introduced her to you, uh, I will ask her to uh, go on with the presentation of her paper. Shudeshna, you may speak now. Good evening, everybody. First of all, am I audible? Can yes, you, you are. First of all, let me thank the seminar organizing committee of Hiralal Bhakat College, Nalati, for giving me this space of sharing my thoughts with you. Um, I also greet my fellow speakers, Professor Shukla Banerjee and Professor Ruth Banita. And I greet my teacher, Professor Shukla Boshushen, uh, the chairperson of the session. In my paper, I'm going to talk about uh, the post partition Bangla memoirs by women. Um, uh, I base my uh, my observations on uh, this on this topic uh, from my re close reading of these memoirs, and it is a much discussed topic. And my observations are come out as very simple as you can also relate to these observations. In the Indian subcontinent, the political maneuver of the partition led to um, deep psychological trauma within the nation uh, that was caused by a sudden and forced physical dislocation from one's properties, dwelling, and kin. So the um, anguish and loss of uh, the, uh, the partition is reflected, amply reflected in the literature of the partition. But if we look into the uh, post-partition Bangla memoirs, it tells a somehow different story. Uh, in spite of the deep and definite sense of loss, uh, we can find that these memoirs are resourceful in a, in a very constructive way. So all the writers of the memoirs, um, they, um, they um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the case of their physical dislocation, in the process of their physical dislocation from the homestead, uh, they uh, embark on a, on a, you can say, on a psychological self-sustaining narrative journey within, in search of an imaginary homeland. If we look into the post-partition Bangla memoirs, such as Bishadriko by Mihir Shengupto, uh, Akhay Malberi by Monindra Gupto, um, Zinda Bahar by Porito Shen, and so on, we'll find Can that almost that all these memoirs follow a pattern in introducing the idea of the lost childhood. Introducing the idea of the lost childhood and uh, Deepesh Chakraborty in Remembered Villages, he explains this idea of the lost childhood because he says that uh, the element of peace and bliss is associated with the childhood and it makes the native village an idyllic space. So the discourse of values is, he says, ultimately associated with the native village that makes it an idyll or an, an panacea. The native village is pictured as both sacred and beautiful. And in contrast, the, the communal violence becomes an act of defilement and violation. So a considerable number of um, post-partition Bangla memoirs are written by women. I will deal with five texts. Amar Mar Baper Bari by Rani Chando, uh, Jibone Jol Chobi by Pratibha Boshu, Shediner Kotha by Montun Tala Shen, Doyamur Kotha by Shunanda Shikdar, and Vipanno Kaler Bhala by Uma Boshu. Among them, Monikun Tala Shen, Rani Chando, and Pratibha Boshu are contemporaries. Uh, their their memoir uh, uh, reflect or represent the uh, final decades of Indian freedom movement, and uh, they lead on to the partition and the post-partition decades. And uh, Umaboshu was born in pre pre um, pre partition Bengal, and she lived through the partition and the decades of terror. Uh, culminating in Mukti Judho, 1971, Shunanda Shikdar was born after the partition and spent her initial 10 years uh, in East Pakistan before migrating to West Bengal in 1961. So uh, from these memoirs, uh, I, I observed that hailing from different decades, all these memoirs offer a closer look into the emotional life of Bengali families, fought 
in the process of migration. So all these memoirs reflect how social political changes affect the domestic sphere and its immediate inhabitants, how it changes the relationship between the women of the family and the domestic helps. Some of them were the Muslims and the agrarian agricultural laborers and the vendors and hawkers who visit the domestic space, such as Shakhaola, Bashanola, and so on. So uh, uh, let us focus on the idea of the image of Bengal. The image of Bengal as a nurturing feminine construct was uh, evoked in the heydays of Indian nationalism by Bonkim Chandra Chatterjee and Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath visualized the bounties of autumn in Bengal as a manifestation of Mother India. In Sharot from Kalpana, in a poem, he says, Aji ki tomar modhuro muroti herinu sharado prabhate, he mato bongo, shamolo ango choliche amul shobhate. This landscape or this image was re-evoked in post-partition Bangla memoirs as an idyllic space, as a twilight zone of reality and imagination. Rani Chandos Amar Mar Baper Bari represents such an idyllic space uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that is a resourceful and feminine world that revolves around the seasonal delicacies, preparation of seasonal delicacies, and the happiness of children. Rani Chando did not experience the forced dislocation of the partition because she had moved to Kalabhavan for studying uh, at Shantiniketan and there she settled in 1933 marrying Anil Kumar Chando, the private secretary of Rabindranath Tagore. And it was Tagore who asked her to document her childhood in a memoir. Rani Chando's memoir recounts her girlhood in her maternal village of Gangadhar Khula which is her mother's ancestral home. In depicting a household run primarily by women, Rani Chandu's grandmother who was a widow and her widowed mother, she makes a departure from the traditional patrilineal notion of Vastu Bhite. Uh, Deepesh Chakraborty points out in Remember Village, Remembered Villages that uh, the idea of Vastu Bhite or homestead is essentially patrilineal because the foundation, the idea of foundation depends much on the male ancestry for generations. Though for Rani Chando, it is Amar Mar Bapir Bari, not Amar Mar Mayer Bari. But we see that in Rani's maternal household, her uncles and aunts abided by the two widows, the will of the two widows, the grandmother and the widowed mother. From Rani Chandra's perspective, women are portrayed there at the center of the village's daily course. Uh, there is the, uh, the, uh, the intelligent and hardworking widow Shundar Bhutan, the witty, amicable Murala Pishi, and so on. And the memoir gradually unfolds a woman centric world predominated by bar broto and folk rituals. There is uh, an extensive depiction of Lalu Broto, Magmundol Broto, Tara Broto. And being a girl, Rani Chanda was very much part of this ritual fasting and worship. And I've seen that the message of plenty and prosperity ingrained in all the seasonal folk rituals helps to build up that idyllic state. Women of the village were also uh, you know, engaged in different artistic activities such as rope making, embroidery, katha sewing intricate floor painting, Alpona, and so on. Rani Chandu's memoir thus provides a rich resource of Bengal's folk culture and art. In this particular memoir, the centrality of the courtyard and the clay hearth with two ovens, do akha unun, becomes uh, very important. The courtyard and the hearth are both symbolic of and witness to the seasonal cycle and the life cycle of the inhabitants. The courtyard is the space for all sorts of agrarian activities such as Chhatu Kota, Kire Kota, Muri Bhaja, and so on, and contained all household belongings. In Rani Chandra's words, I quote, Sharadiner Shamsari Uthane Rukode, Jano Rate Tulerakha, Dhamahara Shamsarta Ne Upur Kore Phelahai, 
রোজ সকালে এইখানে তো দ্য ক্লেয়ার হার্থ প্লেজ অ্যান ইকুয়ালি পিভোটাল রোল ইন রানিং দ্য ডোমেস্টিক হুইল অফ ফুড অ্যান্ড ন্যারিশমেন্ট দ্য প্রিপারেশন অফ খেজুর গুড় আমসত্ত কাশুন দি এনগেজ উইমেন অ্যাজ ওয়েল অ্যাজ এনথুসিয়াস্টিক চিলড্রেন অ্যারাউন্ড দ্য হার্থ হাউ এভার ইন হ্যার ডেপিকশন অফ রুরাল লাইফ রানী চন্দ্র লিভস আউট দ্য আগলিনেস অফ কাস্ট রিলেশনস টু জাস্টিফাই stands again she refers to rabindranath tagore who advised her to leave the negative aspects of village life and to highlight the aesthetic facet of it mm-hmm. such an uh, idealized version of the pre partition world such an idealization could be a conscious effort on the part of the writer to cover up the atrocities of the partition uh, to to observe to substantiate my view I can refer to Shondip Bandhubathai, who observes in his book, Desh Bhag Sriti Ashatta, I quote, In trying to forget those bloodbath memories, some people attempt to hold to the pleasant memories of the days before the partition. In the formation of their memoirs, the stark reality is mellowed down by the deep shadow of the nostalgic past. while rani chandra and sunanda shikda represent the past to uh, a romanticized nostalgia the communist activist monikuntala shen views partition as a moment of breakthrough for the migrant women of bengal towards education and professional emancipation monikuntala shen an educated woman activist from borishal with an urban background was treated by rural uneducated women as a man while the male members of the same community shunned her as a wayward woman had extensive travel through rural bengal in 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 as a part of students activist as a part of students activities as a part of various mass movements including tebhaga movement subjected her to this ambivalent treatment by her countrymen monikuntala shen Uh, was the led she in fact she led the women's wing of communist party of india in post partition decades and she became a full time member of the party in 1942 in 1949 she was arrested for conducting agitations and was sent to the female ward of presidency jail her spirited account of prison life is uh, a reminder of rani chandra's uh, depiction of jenana khatok Ranichand the two was briefly imprisoned for her involvement in nationalist activities Monikuntala uh, Shen's view in in her view Indian women's direct involvement in politics has helped them to attain suffrage and she recalls how women members of communist party played constructive roles in the dissemination of education and awareness among the women of modern India Mars the mohila attaroka samiti was an outfit of cpi that came into being in 1943 and it worked for the migrant women of bengal monikuntala shen noticed a major change among the um, among the migrant women of bengal after the partition because uh, these uprooted young women became more mobile as they commuted by trains and buses in kolkata in search of jobs to provide for the families uh, they opened doors of new job opportunities not only for them but for the women of successive generations here i came across uh, an article by orchit boshu guho choudhury entitled uh, engendered freedom he also refers to monikuntala shen to substantiate his argument that the impact of partition on the bengali migrant women was complex but positive women came out of the domestic space of child rearing and took up significant public duties and it was this way to pro- they worked for the pro- to they worked to provide for the family and, and self liberation was the consequence thus monikuntala shen and pratibha bosh they represent the emancipated voices of the women of bengal in post partition decades monikuntala shen's memoir shediner katha throbs with the vivid accounts of her growth as an 
educated and liberated woman with strong patriotic sentiments and it uh, it records her works among the peasant women of dinajpur during tebhaga movement uh, she observes that the renaissance of indian women began with the tides of indian freedom movement now we see that in contrast to rani jando's portrayal of rural bengal Prati Bhavosh in her memoir Jibone Jal Chabi represents the sophisticated urban culture of Dhaka. Bosch was a prolific writer and she, she grew up in this rich cultural intellectual ambience of Dhaka. In her maiden life, she was known as Ranu Shom. She was a good singer who came in contact of Kaji Nojul Islam and Dilip Kumar Rai, the two musical stalwarts of Bengal during the, the at the heydays of Indian. Um, freedom movement in 1920s and 30s. She also met Rabindranath Tagore, who taught her his own songs. But after her marriage with uh, Buddha de Bosch, the prolific writer, in 1934, she became an integral part of his literary meetings and she took up writing as a profession. She gave up music. And uh, among all these memoirs, Pradipa uh, Bosch, uh, is the writer in professional sense. She sold her novels to film, uh, filmmakers. And uh, thus, uh, in this way, we can say that among all these uh, memoir writers, Pratibha Boshu is a professional writer. Uh, uh, she, she becomes a representative of the emancipated intellectual women of post-partition decades of the memoir, uh, post-partition decades of the partition. OK. The decades following the partition were troubled by communal riots. And the uh, Hindu families in East Pakistan were, um, were troubled by uh, communal tension and subjected uh, to communal tortures by extremist Pakistani government. Uh, Uma Boshu was born in pre-British India and her father wanted her to be well educated. Her education started early, but her grandmother got her married to an educated boy of a poor family. Uma Boshu was the child bride, but her mother-in-law was very affectionate. Uma Boshu's memoir, Bipanno Kalir Bhala, portrays the figure of the mother-in-law as a pillar of strength. The mother-in-law was well aware of the changing political scenario of East Pakistan. And uh, she often discussed the political situation in her kitchen with, with her daughter-in-law. Mm, a courageous, hardworking, and soft-spoken woman, the mother-in-law shared a bond of mutual affection and dependence with her daughter-in-law that withstood the communal carnage. And when her son was killed, murdered before her eyes, she assured her daughter-in-law by saying that, Ami tomake chere jabo nama, tumi ar ami shanti te It requires a lot of mental strength to say so for a woman who has seen her son being killed before her eyes. Uma Boshu portrays a warm little domestic sphere with many children and their affectionate servant Anandomali that was suddenly shattered as Uma's husband was killed one fine morning by the Muslimis, Muslim extremist youths. And the rest of the memoir is a struggle for survival for two women, Uma and her uh, mother-in-law, with five minor children. The vulnerability of the destitute Hindu families during the partition is amply reflected in this memoir. In their struggle for survival, they were, um, they were greatly helped by good-hearted Muslim youths, Ohit and Hannan. And uh, here we are reminded of Urvashi Talia's observation in the other side of silence that there was, however, more to partition than that, she says. There were also innumerable stories of how people had helped each other, stories of friendship and sharing. Engaged in an unequal battle with an oppressive, aggressive state army, uh, Umaboshu realizes with much despair, as she says in her memoir, that these historical incidents uh, have a greater impact on the lives of the common people than that of the political leaders. This is her, her this, I, I refer to her, her own writing. Uh, these memoirs 
with their rich resource of documentation and analysis of facts and the, the expression of uh, the, the personal emotion, private emotions in an intimate tone are capable of providing a subaltern version of the great historical event of the partition. Urvashi Butalia refers to these memoirs as uh, the underside of history. Uh, here we can also refer to Shondip Bandhapathai, who says, uh, I quote, but the individual has a personal small history which is substantiated by the memories of his own experience. By paying heed to that voice, we can move towards the greater history. Mm. Both Doyamoyil Kotha and Vipanno Kaler Bhela are memoirs written by commoners. They were homemakers. Shunanda Shikdar, who spent her initial 10 years in East Pakistan under the care of her aunt, uh, widow aunt uh, Sneholota, who called her Doyamoyi. Uh, in her memoir, Doyamoyi depicts her foster mother as a child widow who got married at nine and became widow at 15. And she suffered from the, um, and she had to undergo the, um, the restrictions of the widowhood uh, since, uh, since a, a very minor, very tender age. And after her father-in-law's demise, she returned to her father's place and she got herself engaged in agrarian activities. She traded the crops and jutes of this land to local traders because after her father's death, her brothers went to work uh, uh, in Hindustan and she traded the crops herself. She, she also she looked after the family properties. Doyamoy's memoir thus portrays a woman who effortlessly interacted with the world from her home while managing both the properties and the household all by herself. In the memoir, the account of the last few days of preparation before they left for Hindustan is poignant with pathos. It explores the layers of emotion residing within a woman who is meticulously settling all property issues distributing her belongings, household belongings among her Muslim neighbors and who is burying all the time her, the pain and despair of leaving her home. Shedin Mayer Mukher Dike Taki, Ami Mone Mone Pratika Kore Chilam, Shunanda Shikdar writes, Ar kakhano desher kotha uccharan korbona. Ma ar amar modhe chirokal desher prashongo anuccari to chilo. A woman has a greater attachment to the family and its activities and their accounts throb with the silent pain as they leave their homesteads. Butalia uh, explores the woman's psyche in her book, Other Side of Sil Silence, in a similar manner. I quote, for many women, partition represented a very fundamental tearing up of the fabric of their lives. A family is, after all, central to the lives of women. Its loss was, therefore, deeply felt. Doya's foster mother cultivated vegetables on her plot, even at the year of their leaving, fully aware that they won't be staying there to consume the produce. She rather asked her nearest neighbor, Shamshir Chacha, to consume the produce when they're ripe and to remember her this way. Dekho Shamshir, batti hoi le tui khayo, mone koi ro didir hatet jinish. So this bond with homeland, I, I, I observe that it's, and its natural landscape is everlasting. That urged her to think beyond her personal properties. The feminine consciousness associated with growth and fruition thus attempted to create her own sustaining existence in her homeland through her own cultivated crops. So uh, in my paper, I have dealt with primarily uh, printed published memoirs by middle class Hindu women who hailed from different backgrounds. Rani Chandu was an artist, Prati Bhavosh, a writer, Moni Kuntala Shin, a political activist, uh, Shunanda Shikdar and Uma Boshu, both homemakers. Uh, through the artist's eye of Rani Chandu, the pre partition world and its people are portrayed quite aesthetically in an idyllic, romanticized manner. While Pratibha Boshu's sociological analysis represents the entire milieu of the decades following World War II, Moni Kuntala, an activist, views the political turmoil of the Indian subcontinent as the mobilizing force 
behind the emancipation of migrant Bengali women, while for Shunanda Shikdar and Uma Boshu, the partition stands for terrible personal loss and dislocation, a phase of memory they wish to obliterate. So uh, I'd like to say that for these women, uh, diverse social locations cause difference of perspectives on the same event related to their homeland. So um, I may conclude by saying in post-partition Bangla memoirs, the articulation of a turbulent time from women's perspective offer a deeper look into the interior setup of the uprooted families where mothers and grandmothers worked as unifying forces and gave shelters to destitute kin and widowed daughters amidst the carnage of communal riots wandering as migrants in a severed country instead of brooding over the lost home state these women set foot at the public domain for providing their families while trying to reconstruct an imaginary landscape of sustenance through recollection of lost familiar images in their memoirs thank you Can you hear me now? Thank you very much, Dr. Mojundar, for a very interesting paper and uh, allowing us to <coughs> peep into the minds of those Bengali writers who have been uh, the the pillars on which women's writing post-independence have uh, you know have risen. I mean, have, or are or unfounded. Are, are there and uh, uh, since you mentioned Pruti Babushu to discuss her I would just like to add that she is one of those very few writers in Bengali including male writers who really write fiction about the partition a very moving story of hers which is uh, in Dupul uh, Hara in Bangla and translated Merun in English uh, talks uh, very frankly about the terrible atrocities that were perpetrated on women coming from East Pakistan into India. Thank you. Can we go on to the next speaker or do we take questions here? Uh, Shukladi, uh, Dr. Banerjee is present, so we can move on uh, to our first speaker, Dr. Shukla uh, We welcome you to this webinar, Professor Shukla Banerjee, Professor and Head of English, Government, Nagarjuna Postgraduate College of Science, Raipur, Chhattisgarh. You have had a long experience in teaching postgraduate classes. And you are equally rich experience in supervising no less than 19 scholars in their PhD work. Your hobbies include creative writing and listening to music. And your paper today is on gender issues in literature and overview. Now you may please proceed. Good evening, everyone. In front of the August audience, I take this opportunity and to the organizers, Dr. Gautam Sen and members for giving me an opportunity to deliver my lecture in an international webinar, Transforming Disciplines, the Effect of Gender. I also congratulate the staffs of Hiranol Bhagat College, Dalhati, for organizing this webinar. The day God had created Adam and Eve, gender issues had started. The day God had created, gender issues had started. According to the Bible, Eve was born from one of the rib of ribs of Adam. Hence the weaker part. And from that very, very day, for centuries, women have been suffering 
the brunt of servitude. Why? Because she is born in a patriarchal society and a phallocentric society. The subjective reality of a woman for centuries was like that woman. Gender discrimination, gender distinction, gender bias, gender politics, and so on. The brunt of servitude was so much. Ma'am, you you have not been removed. You are being hard. मैं तो सब करके दे रहा हूँ वहाँ से मैं आपका कनेक्शन रिमूव उन्होंने किया आप उनसे पूछ लीजिए ना क्यों रिमूव किया मैं थोड़ी ना पूछूँ। Ma'am, we can hear you properly. Hello. Hello, we can hear you properly. वो तो कुछ बोल रहे हैं आपके यहाँ पे आपके लिए चाहिए। Hello, we can we can hear you properly. Work at unifying forces and give shelters to destitute kin and widowed daughters amidst the carnage of communal riots, wandering as migrants in a severed country. Instead of brooding over the laws of the state, these women set foot at the public domain for providing their families while trying to reconstruct an imaginary landscape of sustenance through recollection of lost familiar images in their memoirs. Thank you. Hello, uh, Professor Banerjee, please unmute your system. Unmute your microphone. 
একসাথে দুটো চললে ইকো হবে হ্যালো প্রফেসর ব্যানার্জি ক্যান ইউ হিয়ার মি হ্যালো হ্যালো প্রফেসর ব্যানার্জি yes 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 uh, there is probably another uh, computer or mobile phone where the youtube uh, streaming is live so can you please stop that because that is getting reflected in this particular meeting now it is stopped yes yes now now it is clear your sound is clear please switch on the video Yes now now we can see you now uh, please start your uh, good evening everyone in front of the august audience i take this opportunity to extend my heartiest thanks to the organizers dr gautam sen and members for giving me an opportunity to deliver my lecture in an international webinar transforming disciplines the effect of gender I also congratulate the staff of Vidyalal Bhagat College Nalhati for organizing this webinar. My topic is gender issues in literature and overview. The day God had created Adam and Eve, gender issues had started. According to the Bible, and Eve was born from one of the ribs of Adam. hence the weaker part and from that very day our uh, gender issues had started gender discrimination uh, gender bias gender politics uh, and uh, uh, gender distinctions social distinction of uh, uh, gender masculine and feminine and the subjective reality of a woman was like that only for for centuries she had to bear the brunt of servitude because she was born in a phallocentric society and a, a patriarchal society a woman was confined to the heart and home she was not allowed to go outside she was just a wife a mother and and a daughter and she had to look after uh, a father a brother and husband the discrimination was so much that even distributing food also this uh, discrim uh, discrimination went on like if the boy of the household would get 10 sandwiches the girl would get only two just imagine the ratio one is to five and if i say in bengali the pola re dibe dosta lushi ar maya re dibe dui ta lushi maya der eto khaite na this continued and continued and of course feminism the consciousness had started in the 18th century and women had started uh, thinking of themselves because before that uh, they were only uh, meant for sexual purity modest behavior and uh, they could not go outside the and the restrictions were so much that uh, they were not even uh, they did not get even education they could not go uh, to school to a college and uh, uh, to get education but somehow they managed to write and i would say that uh, the bronte sisters the bronte sisters were fortunate enough to write but they could not get their uh, get their uh, uh, novels published because uh, no publisher would publish their novels the reason was that they were women 
Hence, they had to write anonymously or under the pseudonym of Carter Ellis and Acton Bell. Even George Eliot had the same problem, and she had also had to write under the pseudonym. This continued all the women writers, they went on writing, and if we see the novels of uh, uh, Charlotte Bronte, Jane Eyre, Jane Eyre, Shirley, Willett, Professor, uh, in, in which we find that uh, our women are all suffering from unrequited love. Not only Charlotte Bronte, Emily Bronte, uh, Bronte's novel, Wuthering Heights, had also the same theme. Anne Bronte, who had written only one novel, the tenant of Wilfred Hall also uh, had to suffer all these things. Elizabeth Gaskell also had to write under the pseudonym for some time, but somehow she managed to escape this. No advantages were given to the woman. They were not given money. They, they did not have money to publish their novels. And so they uh, could not publish their novels. And they had to only write in one genre, and that was novels. Because the, the main writers would not allow them to write plays. And you know, if I talk about Alexander Pope, he also, he denied the plays of Eliza Haibu, and uh, she was not allowed to, uh, to play the uh, plays on the stage. This went on up to even uh, Jane Austen. Jane Austen's uh, novel, Sense and Sensibility, uh, she has written that she could not get the education, but her brothers went to Oxford. So this was the condition at that time, but still women were writing up to Virginia Woolf and the male members were also writing. She was also writing. Uh, they were getting their novels published. Afro-American writers, Afro-American writers also had the same problem, but of course we would like to, we would like to name some uh, novels of uh, uh, the female novelist, Frances this novel, Evelina, Henry Davis, The Reformed Cockpit, Frances Burley, uh, Anne Radcliffe, The Mysteries of Rodolfo, Emily Bronte, Charlotte Bronte, and uh, uh, the Anne Bronte, and uh, uh, Sylvia Plas, The Bell Jar. The condition was so poor that even in the even in the America, the Afro-American women had to suffer a lot. Uh, they were put in a triple jeopardy status: racism, sexism, classism. So they could not see the light for so many years, but still, according to their consciousness, they went on writing and published their novels. And I would like to say that the in the 20th century, when Virginia Woolf was writing, uh, she also felt the same thing. And uh, it is so tragic that uh, she had to uh, commit suicide because she was not allowed to uh, uh, go to school or go to college and uh, she had to bear the brunt of servitude. No beatitude, no fortitude was there in her life. Uh, I would like to also tell that uh, uh, the female writers, the feminist writers uh, like uh, uh, George Eliot, uh, her novel The Middle March, was just uh, uh, like uh, 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 an attempt 
to go against the male society and the patriarchal society, the phallocentric society, do so and and do something uh, new in the field of uh, in the field of um, writing. But now, woman has come a long way, and uh, uh, what had started with Dil ke arma asmo me behegay. Am wafa kar ke bhi tanha rahe gaye. The two, Munni badnam hui, darling, tere liye and Sheila ki jawani. So all this have started now, and women have uh, women have shown their sheen. They have broken the uh, uh, light ceiling. They have now seen light at the end of the tunnel, and now they are. Showing their sheen also. This was this continued up to 20th century. I would talk like to talk about 20th century, but when in the 21st century, the things have changed. And now, if I uh, see the lockdown and uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, men are doing so many things. They are mopping the floor. They are. Uh, uh, washing the utensils, they are uh, washing the clothes, they are looking after the children. So we can say that women, if they, women with their grit and gumption, they have uh, they have conquered uh, the male society in a way that they are now uh, very well doing in the in the in the field of literature. You know, Bartha Mason, if I talk about Bartha Mason of uh, Charlotte Bronte's novel, Jane Eyre, Bartha Mason was a mad woman who, who had, who had uh, been put in the attic because she was mad. But, and we can also say that Jane Eyre was the alter ego of uh, the mad woman, Bartha Mason. But now the total scenario has changed. What we are seeing is totally different. It is very positive that women are coming in, coming, conquering every field and they are doing uh, everything what they want to do. This much I want to say thank, uh, thank you for the patient hearing. Thank you so much. Is the presentation over, Dr. Banerjee? Is the uh, yes, presentation over? It's over. It's yes, over. It's over. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Professor Ruth Vanita has not yet joined. Uh, okay, so we can we have a break? Time, uh, yeah, I think because uh, we have not yet got any uh, question uh, in uh, either in YouTube or the, over here in chat box. Uh, hmm. The uh, participants who are present over here, uh, can will you uh, like to share some observation or question, anything like that? Uh, anyone? Or we'll uh, go for a break just for ten minutes and uh, ten minutes and rejuvenate at uh, seven fifty-five. So I think uh, it's better to now to go for a break for 10 minutes. And, okay, thank uh, you so much. Okay, Shukladi, we will get back at 7.55. 7.55, right. Okay, fine. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, thank you, Sudeshna. So please uh, get back at 7.55. We will have an interactive session at the end of the third paper. So please be present uh, during that time. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Everyone.
good evening uh, professor banik sir good evening yeah Hello. actually we were continuing with our session and uh, we have completed our first two papers uh, okay. so we just uh, uh, having a 5 minutes break we will be uh, starting your uh, paper from uh, 755 onwards is it 750 already so just 5 minutes yeah. and okay. uh, we will be continuing with your paper thank you for okay. joining us uh, sure thank you <clears throat> to this webinar yes oh thank you <laughs> Uh, Shukla ji, uh, shall we start? Uh, yes. Professor Bhanita yes, has think, already joined us. I think we should start. Yes, yes, I would yes, like yes, to uh, welcome Professor Ruth Bhanita, and although she needs very little introduction, uh, it is uh, 
just for formalities that I say that she is much published and much discussed and she is an activist for women's rights. She is professor of English and co-director co South and South Asian, Southeast Asian Studies, University of Montana. Her various areas of interest are history of ideas, gender and sexuality, studies in Hindi and Urdu literature, Hindu philosophy, British literature as in Shakespeare and the long 19th century. Her paper today is titled Same Sex Unions in Indian Literature and History, which purports to be a brief examination of the depiction of same sex unions in Indian literature and media reports from 1980 onwards of how low income group couplings are happen take place and often joint suicides also take place when they are prevented from marrying. So we are in for a very, very interesting session and I would like you to proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk today about, wait a minute. Um, I have to just share the screen one minute. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk today uh, about, um, I'm going to talk today about history and uh, what I say is mainly based on uh, my books. Um, so Same Sex Love in India, which was co-edited and Love's Right, uh, which is about the phenomenon uh, that Professor Mondal mentioned about um, uh, young low income group uh, couples uh, running away and to get married or commit joint suicide. Um, so, um, okay, I'm going to start with some general ideas about what union is. Uh, so in ancient Indian literature, I have argued that friendship is the most important relationship. It's the overarching relationship which in which all other relationships uh, fit. Um, in the Vedas, friendship between gods and humans is the most important relationship. Later in texts like the Upanishads, the Gita, the epics, uh, there are many conversations between uh, humans, between humans and other beings, between humans and animals, uh, of course, between teacher and student. Um, there is no clear dividing line between what in English we call love and friendship as if they are two different things. But in earlier societies, even in the West, but in India for sure, the, the, it's a fluid kind of what is love and what is friendship. Um, I've argued in Love's Right that marriage is a type of friendship and friendship is a type of marriage. Uh, Aristotle also made a similar argument when he said that marriage is a type of friendship. If you look at... Uh, how marriage is uh, defined, the wedding ceremony, it is about taking seven steps together, and well, that's one of the rituals, and um, speaking seven uh, shlokas together. Similarly, friendship too, in friendship too, there are uh, cases where they walk around the fire together to form a friendship uh, between two men. And also friendship is defined in the Panchatantra, for example, and many places as taking seven steps together and speaking seven words together. Uh, so basically it's forming a union and also friendship, unlike what we may think of today as a friend, as anybody you go out for coffee with. Um, at that time, friends, uh, friends throughout uh, pre-modern, throughout uh, history, right up to the 19th century, I would say in, in many Western and many societies, including in Indian society, friendship is a very, very important life-defining union. You can only have one or two friends, close friends, because it is such a commitment. Uh, true friends are inseparable. They share everything. They will live together. They will die for each other. They will um, uh, very often die together. There are stories in the ancient texts where one friend uh, dies and the other friend kills himself. Uh, so this is, these are not much discussed stories, but they are very important, I think, um, which I've talked about in Same Sex Love in India. Um, 
so true friends uh, they share everything and they're willing to do anything for each other now where how does this type of attachment any type of close attachment arise so i have argued in several books that um the indian explanation of this is um uh, that it is because of attachment in a former birth or oh, that's the primary there are many reasons but that's the primary reason that when you inexplicably uh, like or dislike a person or a place or an activity this is because of an attachment from a former birth and this explanation is found in ancient texts but also in modern uh, society uh, when these young women who ran away together uh, facing so much social disapproval and so much violence they still remain attached to each other most of them are young women there are some men as well uh, or even when a man and a woman face a lot of social disapproval and still stay together very often the explanation given by parents by priest by so, by society is well if they are willing to face all this for the sake of this relationship then it must be an attachment from a former birth which we can't really fight against yeah um in uh, and this and though this uh, in modern uh, say in mo cinema which is the most modern of art forms um uh, these type of life defining unions between friends and in cinema it's usually between male friends the tradition still continues in the de depiction of two men who have girlfriends or one of them may have a girlfriend so uh, this is not a sexual union but it is what i would call a romantic friendship a life defining union in which the other person is the prime in which this is the primary relationship and uh, right up to the uh, in the 90s this begins to change because of anxiety about the relationship being read as homosexual but before that there are innumerable examples of this where the friends live together die together die for each other you can think of anand and shole and dosti in 1964 and uh, i'm familiar only with um, bombay cinema but uh, i think it is this is also present in other language cinemas um, oh. movies um where the friends do everything together and often die for each other they stay and they sing songs together this is not found in any other world cinema where the where the relationship is so primary and so important so um and in order to understand this one has to also one has to understand that um sorry something went wrong there one minute yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> what is going on but i'm trying to get it to be a slide show but that's not happening um okay let's see yeah okay so um can you see the can you see it can you see the powerpoint yes you can see it yes we can see we can see okay good all right uh, because it's coming out very strange here but anyway on my screen but uh, all right so i'm coming to the point of now so i talked about friendship and now of course i'm talking going to talk about sexual or erotic union now the important thing to of course to remember which we often forget due to victorian attitudes having intervened is that in hindu thought karma or desire is not a bad thing uh, karma is one of the four aims of life the classic four classical aims of life and more, and uh, uh, desire is also a god okay karma deva of course uh, in the gita krishna says i am desire that is not opposed to dharma and karma or desire is not only for sexual union it is also any desire desire for pleasure based basically of any kind uh, so in the kama sutra for example it doesn't talk only about sex it also talks about the 64 arts which everyone should know and these include things like painting and flower arrangement and music that an edu educated person should have a familiarity with all of these um so that's important to remember uh in the okay so somehow these things have superimposed themselves on each other but basically i was showing trying to show the ardhanarishwara and an ancient version of it and a modern version of that idea which we are all familiar with um i uh, now this ardhanarishwara image it is this is the most well known image of ardhanarishwara but um one could uh, also one it's also true to say that all the gods and goddesses are both masculine and feminine and the ardhanarishwar image can be interpreted to mean in several ways it could mean the union of uh, shiva and parvati husband and wife fusion of them it could mean that all beings are bisexual all beings have masculine as well as feminine tendencies just as the gods do and the, and it could also mean purusha and prakriti the two uh, principles that make up the universe and that are, okay so um when we look 
at uh, art of the uh, ancient art, of course, we're all familiar with the images of um, uh, various types of uh, sexual union. But it's important to note that these types of sexual union are shown as part of the cosmos. When you look at the temple, you have to go up really close and focus on one little image to see what is going on there. Otherwise, when you look at the temple, um, what you temples, what you see is everything is going on there. So from war to animals, to music, to dance, to uh, conversations, to sexual union, to flying, to different types of spirits and beings and gods and humans and animals, everything is there. So it is basically the, the vitality and vibrancy of the cosmos, the Vishwa Rupa, one could say in a sense, um, that is being uh, depicted. And uh, when you are further away from the temple, this is how it looks. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, to, with modern media, we can focus in on just one thing, but it isn't that just one thing. It is showing sexual union of all types as part of the whole universe. And I think that's a very important point that one can often lose sight of. Okay, uh, so I don't have much time and I'm just going to, of course, be just touching on a few highlights. So let me talk about uh, these 14th century texts that I have written about in, at great, in great detail. Uh, these are specifically texts found only in Bengal, uh, both in Bengali and in Sanskrit. And the texts are about uh, two women, two co-widows, two co-wives who become co-widows, and they are, uh, they they have uh, they they have a relation with relationship sexual relationship with each other, and uh, they produce a child who is the famous Bhagirath who brings the Ganga down to earth. Now this version of Bhagirath's birth is only found in these Bengal uh, texts, 14th century onwards, uh, not found in the rest of the country as far as I know. And these are very unique and remarkable texts. Um, uh, the, they are partly based on, they're based on this ancient, the ancient idea found in medical texts as well as in the epics, that uh, the father contributes the hard parts of a child's, of, a, of the fetus and the mother contributes the soft parts. But the, this medical text, Sushruta Samhita says that if two women have intercourse, somehow one becomes pregnant, a boneless child will be the result. Now the stories do, these stories I was mentioning, they do some wonderful things with this and show how this child is born in some texts, born boneless and then cured in other texts, born beautiful beautiful because of divine blessing. So basically, it's because of the divine blessing that the two women are supposed to, or divine plan that the two women can produce a child. And um, this is a remarkable story for which I haven't found a comparable story anywhere in the world. And this is an this is from one of the texts where you see the two women just fall in love in the romantic rainy season. And they have, uh, they play and they make love and the child is born and then they are worried about it and the gods assure them that there is nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Okay. To come now to medieval India. In medieval India, in the Persian, Urdu, Turkish, uh, Arabic, etc. texts, um, which these were written about by Salim Kidwai in the in our book Same Sex Love in India. So you have three or four different types of relationships. I would say <coughs> one are long-term relationships. Uh, for example, these two poets where one dies and the other one observes the period of mourning for him. Uh, and then among these long term relationships, you have mystical. Uh, so some of them are not mystical and some of them are mystical relationships where uh, they are participating in mysticism together. But it is a kind of eroticism as well. And uh, the third kind, which is very interesting, which is found is just these casual relationships which happen everywhere in which are found in the urban areas between men. This is all between men uh, where they in the streets and the markets, etc. Uh, men find other men. Okay. Uh, and then I want, I want to come to 18th century, uh, late 18th, early 19th century poetry in Urdu, uh, which I have written this book about, Gender, Sex, and the City. And uh, so these are some of the poets who wrote this kind of poetry. Uh, so in the poetry, some of the poetry has a male speak, a man speaking, most of it, but some of poetry has a woman speaking. And in this very interesting poetry, the poetry is about um, uh, women's lives. Basically, it's women's lives, women's loves, and the, the poets who are writing this are very important major poets. They are not minor poets, uh, most of them. Uh, the poetry is about everything to do with life. So the people working in the house. The, but interestingly, it's not about being a wife and a mother. It is about the pleasures of life, about shopping and jewelry and fashion and uh, so on. And it is also about love. And most of the love is between women. Uh, so and you have this uh, the, now, the interesting thing I found while doing this research is that the poets write about male-female love. 
female female love and male male love all in the same tone so the tones vary that can be romantic sad uh, humorous playful etc so here's an example of playful poetry um nahak nahak mujhe jalati kyon hai ghar mein mere aag lene aati kyon hai aayi tu to nahi thehti ye ranjish hai befaida yahan tu aati jaati kyon hai so it's a playful tone of a woman speaking to another woman and saying why do you keep coming and bothering me if you're not interested in me so um another aspect of this uh, so i translated a lot of this poetry and in my book and another aspect of this uh, with the, which is very ex extraordinary is that the, the there are descriptions in prose of how women used to form couples by uh, performing certain rituals and one of the rituals is this one called ilaichi um, in which the which the writer actually says was a type of marriage he uses the word shaadi and he says that they perform this ritual and it's a type of marriage between the two women but it is a type of marriage among their female companions which means that the women could have been doesn't exclude relationships with men the women could have been married to men they could have been having relationships with men but they still also perform this they might perform this ritual with another woman uh, so i have recently written a novel called memory of light uh, which has just appeared from penguin this this month it's available uh, from amazon and flipkart and everywhere as a book and also as an ebook and it's a short novel uh, based on my research but it's uh, where i imagine a love story set in 18th century lucknow between these two women one from banaras uh, one from lucknow but the story unfolds mostly in lucknow a little bit in delhi and it is told by a woman uh, one of the two women later in life but it also shows all the various friendships uh, male female relationships and i have some historical characters some of the poets are also actually characters in the novel um so in the uh, i also uh, translate some of the poetry in it uh, uh, because one of the women is a poet herself okay so here for example the poetry is 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 very explicit about that these are sexual relationships but it's not explicit usually about it's not about the mechanics of sex but it's extremely suggestive um uh, for example this one about my hands devoted themselves to you last night i felt devoted to my hands all night okay so now coming to the colonial period and of course we have to we have to do this very fast because of time constraints coming to the colonial period proper which is which really starts when the british uh, uh, monarch actually takes over the rule of india this is after 1857 after the revolt was crushed after the 1857 revolt was crushed um, uh, the british were very vindictive and they actually smashed the cultures of north indian cities many cities uh, but i just wanted to point out what happens in terms of attitudes towards pleasure and towards sexuality all sexuality not just uh, same sex sexuality uh, and i just want to give you an example of how different these attitudes were in england and in india at the time now here is one of my one of the main the poets i write about uh, whom i whom uh, i'm um, admirer of this poet uh, insha and here's an example of one of his poems so he wrote poems uh, between women between men between men and women and here's an example of a man speaking to a man where the man is asking the man for kisses and that emerges in jan nikle hai o mia de dal so the use of the word mia means he's clearly talking to a man and the poet this is a major insha is a very major poet and writer um, and he doesn't uh, this is not hidden poetry he's openly writing about this which which um, confirms my point that before the british period same sex love was never uh, unspeakable or silenced uh, it was not um, there were no examples of executions for it as they were in england and europe uh, now here take the example of incha's contemporary the dates are more or less overlapping lord byron and he wrote he's well well known for having affairs with women but what many people don't know is that he also fell in love deeply with men perhaps more deeply with men as some of his biographers would argue and now from his letters it is very clear that he belonged to a group of friends who were interested in men he wrote poetry to men but when he did it he did not reveal the gender of the lover as insha reveals the gender he either changed the the pronouns from he to she or he used the i you kind of mode where you can't to uh, figure out what the gender is and that is because in england at the time to write poetry from one man to another uh, or or to be found having homosexual relations would mean basically exile imprisonment death you could be a lot of people were tortured and killed in england so that's the difference in attitudes so um 
when the British uh, come to uh, India, uh, they, many Britishers are, of course, very happy to find the range of sexual arrangements they fi find in India. So everything from courtesans to same-sex relationships to polygamy to polyandry, there's a whole range of things you can uh, that, that are not allowed in England or in Europe. But uh, after 1857, there is a certain tightening up that happens in the 19th century in the Victorian period. This is the Victorian period. Uh, so what the British do after they uh, assume the rule of the country is that that through the laws, through the legal education system, they take control of the education system and of the administrative system. And they basically gradually, over the next 100 years, they turn homosexuality into something unspeakable. They turn courtesans basically into sex workers. And there's a difference between courtesans and sex workers, big difference. But they turn them into sex workers through the law. And uh, Indians, too, educated Indians, both Hindu and Muslim, uh, and this is, I mean, mainly men, they internalize these attitudes. So Indians themselves, uh, this includes social reformers, nationalists later, everybody from the left to the right and everything in between, whether it's Gandhi or it's the communists, there is this new attitude that the only good um, sex is, is sex within heterosexual monogamous marriage. And Indians become very ashamed of their literary heritage of all this poetry, which is celebrating love of different kinds. And so what happens is that this poetry called Rekhti, which is about love between women, among other things, this poetry basically, it disappears. It remains in manuscripts. It is not printed. It, I had to copy it out from manuscripts in libraries mostly. And the little bits that are printed are severely censored with all the sexual stuff being uh, blocked out. And uh, these poets actually disappear from the canon for a long time. Uh, this is an example of a manuscript that was almost lost. Um, so what you can see is that in this 100 years, there's this huge change of attitudes. In the 1820s, poets like Insha are openly writing about same-sex relationships. But by the 1920s, when Hindi writer Ugra, who was a Gandhian, he published some short stories about homosexuality. And even though his stories were negative, were making negative comments on homosexuality, he was still condemned by most other writers. And all of them said homosexuality should never be written about. It is an unspeakable thing. It's obscene. It should never be mentioned in polite society. So in 100 years, it goes from being openly talked about and even celebrated to being obscene. In the same city, because Ugra also was from UP, and he writes about Lucknow. So uh, Lucknow, Delhi, all these cities. So that is the kind of change that uh, comes about. I also wanted to mention that in the in the earlier poetry, in this type of poetry, uh, there were many, at uh, poetry and prose, there were many words for a woman's female lover, for a man's female lover, for uh, sex between women. There were many terms and words for these. Okay, But in, in the 20th century, when it becomes unspeakable, many of these words, they don't totally disappear, but they uh, fall out of literature. They disappear from literature, I would say. OK, and then to come finally to this uh, phenomenon that I had been collecting newspaper reports from 1980 onwards. There may have been reports earlier, too. I was just uh, started in 1980 of these young women. And these young women, the interesting thing about them is that most of them are non-English speaking. Uh, they are not highly educated. They have no contact with any movement. They don't know any word like lesbian or gay, and they don't call themselves by any such any word at all, any identity. They are just young women who are mostly poor. These include factory workers, fisherwomen, um, agricultural workers. I think the most educated that I found was two nurses. Uh, but otherwise, you know, and, and they are living in small towns and rural areas all over the country. And they fall in love with each other. And they uh, decide to they try they get married by religious rites. That is, uh, they, they either garland each other or they have a priest who performs the religious rites. And these include Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Dalits, tribals, everyone. I've got uh, uh, so in the new updated version of my book, I have a list of all these from 1980 to today. It's still going on today. I have a list of these women and where they were from. And there are a few men also. There are a few male couples also. Uh, this new edition will only be produced by Penguin if there is enough demand for it. So if you order it from Amazon or you try to buy it, then if there are enough orders, they will reprint it. Uh, it's ready to go, but they will only produce it at that point. So what I was interested in is just one example. I said the educated, the most educated, these two nurses. So what I was interested in is two or three things. One is 
why did these women pick the language of marriage and of death? So they, there was no movement at the time for international movement for, for marriage equality or anything of the sort. And But these women just thought of getting married on their own with no contact with each other all over the country. And in, many, in some cases, which I found most interesting, the families actually, after initial disapproval, the families then went ahead and celebrated the marriages. So in the case of these two women and partner, uh, the families actually celebrated the marriage. There were 200 guests. And uh, Jaya's sister got married to a man at the same time. So the same priest performed both the marriages to save money. You know, many families do this. They had a dual marriage. So the priest, as well as the family, took this marriage seriously uh, of these two nurses. But of course, the government registrar refused to register the marriage. She said, you can do whatever ceremony you like. It was a woman registrar, but I can't register this marriage. Yeah. So. But many other families who violently try to separate the women, and then what the women do is very often they commit joint suicide or they try to commit joint suicide. Now, joint suicide of a couple, again, is something which is an Asian phenomenon. Uh, it has been, I've found, I've found cases in Nepal and Pakistan and Japan, but it's not a Western phenomenon. Uh, so individual suicide, of course, by LGBT people is common in the West, but not joint suicide. And there's something very specifically, I think, uh, Asian or Indic about this phenomenon. India is what I know about. But um, the other thing is that when they, when they committed joint suicide or tried to commit joint suicide, they often left notes saying, if we can't be married in this life, we'll be married in the next life. So, And they also said uh, very often that, please bury us together or cremate us together, depending on the community. Um, so I uh, uh, was interested in exploring where they got this language of marriage and of death, and of death as a kind of marriage. And so I looked at the historical, literary, and religious, and philosophical uh, background to this from the past and in the present, and how it was understood by the priests and the journalists and so on. So some of this, so this is a this is a Swami uh, Bodhananda who performed in '93 the marriage of two men. And so I interviewed him to ask him what he thought, why he did it, and this is his part of his explanation. There was a long explanation. This is part of his explanation. This is the marriage. This is the uh, couple today. Uh, and similarly, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, when, when um, the anti-sodomy law was over was overturned uh, and then again upheld he tweeted and said that uh, there are male and female elements in every being sometimes one is dominant sometimes the other uh, which is which is what i had earlier said when i talked about the other narishwara another very interesting explanation by a priest whom i uh, interviewed in 2002 is uh, he said marriage is a union of spirits and the spirit is not male or female so he was asked to perform this wedding he thought about it and he gave this explanation which is of course an accurate explanation not just in hindu but I think for most religions, the spirit is not male or female. Uh, this was the wedding um, that was performed. Um, so uh, uh, he, so that that is uh, one point. And also another explanation given by many, including the neighbors of some of these women. In 1987, two young police women got married. So the neighbor neighbor was interviewed, woman neighbor who was a village school teacher, and she gave an explanation that is also given in ancient Indian texts and that priests have also given, which is that if they are so attached to each other, it must be due to an attachment in a previous birth. And I find that explanation very interesting because it is given, and, and I should say that this is not just a same-sex phenomenon. Uh, this is a phenomenon that is also, um, I'm trying to get back to the screen. Let me see. Okay. Um, I'm trying to get back to uh, the other. Professor Vanita, you are actually having too much. We are having time. Don't. Don't yeah, uh, rush so much. Can you, we are can, you see me now? can you see me now? I'm trying to yes. uh, change the screen. Okay. Let yes, yes, yes. We can see you. We can see you. You can see me now. Okay. So I wanted to conclude by saying that this is, and I think this is a very important point, which uh, which is often missed, is that in India, at least, there is a commonality between uh, same-sex and cross-sex couples. So there are... Uh, your, uh, sorry, your, your video has been switched off now. Please uh, switch on the camera. One. Okay. Yes, now you can. Now you are seeing. No, I didn't stop. Again, stop. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Oh, oh. can you Something see? Is happening. Can you see me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. We can see. Okay. No. Okay. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> no. Again, it stopped. 
All right. Can you give me instructions on how to do this? Uh, you are uh, putting the icon of uh, camera on the on mode or off mode. It is right off or it is on. Yes. I now, now you are seeing. Now you are seeing. <laughs> getting off. Again, it's getting off. Uh, do the previous action that you did. Huh? Excuse me. Just the previous activity that you did, uh, because you were seen previously. Just uh, two, three seconds back, you were seen. Ah, uh, yeah, I didn't do anything. It may be the internet. I'm not sure. Um, oh, no, then no issue. You continue. <laughs> then it's not within our control. Thank you. Okay. Okay, no problem. Can you see me now? No. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was trying to, uh, they can't see the picture for some reason. Okay. So I was trying to, so here is where it is present now. Then there's yes. it's the second half. Oh. Professor Vanita, you can go on with the lecture. We can hear you. Okay, uh, so what I was trying to say is that there are as many reports and uh, incidents of uh, male-female couples uh, running away and uh, getting married by religious rites and committing joint uh, or attempting joint suicide. As you know, this is also a very common phenomenon. So it's and and what's why this is important is I think that it is not unique to same-sex lovers to do this. Cross-sex lovers are doing it maybe in larger numbers because there are more of them. So that's a very important common point that it's about defining your love or your relationship in certain terms. And uh, that is common to both same-sex and cross-sex lovers. And I think that's, a, again, specifically, I think, Indic, maybe Asian uh, kind of phenomenon, um, and which is uh, very interesting. So yeah. OK, so I think I'll stop there. Um, yeah, I don't know why the camera is kind of off. But, yeah. So we can go to questions if there are any. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can yes, hear yes, you. Yes, we can. Okay. I have just one observation to make on your brilliant paper. That is that I was not aware of this Bhogirat myth of his being born of a same-sex union, and that was very interesting to hear. Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, these texts are not uh, widely known, though they're very much available. Yes. And I, it was due to research that I found these texts, discovered them, and I, I'm still working on it. I'm still finding more texts of this kind. And it's only in Bengal that I've, that these texts have been found. This type of this story has been uh, found, which again, I think is interesting. Yeah. That's a very interesting discovery because I've been reading myths since I was a child and I haven't come across this before. Yes. If you very interesting to hear from you. Yeah. If you look at my books, uh, so same sex in same sex love in India in Love's Right, I have discussed at length and translated these texts, compared them to each other, and so on. So you can read about them in in both. Okay, of these. okay, we'll do, we'll do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the work that you're doing now, collecting these reports, is very important work. Have you finished doing it, compiling these reports, or do you intend to carry this work on a little further? Well, the book Love's Right came out uh, many years ago, and an updated version is now ready. The press will issue it when there is enough demand for the book. It's called Love's Right. The book is called Love's Right, Same-Sex Marriage. I think I read a review of this in uh, of, uh, last week's Telegraph. No that, was, no, that was my novel that you read a review of. That oh. novel. The novel is Memory of Light, which is based on the uh, on the Urdu poetry and prose and the life, the literary culture of Lucknow and oh. Delhi. In the it's a love story, and that's that's called Memory of Life. That's a novel. Love's Right is not a novel. It's a book about these uh, runaway couples, these couples who got married or committed joint suicide. So they're two separate books. Yeah. Ma'am, would you like to uh, tell us just a brief outline of your uh, the storyline of your novel? 
So okay, we are so very the interested. The novel is told in the the speaker in the novel. The narrator is a woman called Nafis Bai, who is a poet and a courtesan. Lives in a kota, courtesan household in Lucknow, and she is now old and she is remembering her youth and she is remembering this youthful uh, relationship and she is narrating her life. You can say, and the relationship is with a woman called Chapla, who is from. Um, uh who is from uh, banaras and visiting lucknow and so the relationship unfolds as a friendship and intellectual friendship and a love relationship ultimately and also it, uh, it the novel gives a picture of other her, and i'm also very interested in the in the relations between the non sexual relationships between men and women uh, which were difficult in, in in earlier times but courtesans were the few among the few women who could have non sexual relationships friendships intellectual friendships with men so that's something i show in the novel about Ch chapla nafis's relationships and friendships with men male poets and i have uh, historical characters actual poets as characters in the novel and uh, so relationships with friends with neighbors with people working in the house uh, going going out for excursions for picnics so the life of the time it was a very sophisticated and cosmopolitan city and i i have uh, i think that it was a modern and indigenous type of modernity it was uh, it was different from post colonial modernity in the sense uh, that it was uh, that pleasure and play were valued for themselves uh, that you could uh, enjoy yourself was a good thing and i think after victoria the victorian era uh, our modern idea of uh, life changes our world view changes and we think that unless something is done for a moral purpose or a social purpose unless we are trying to change society or we are trying to uh, become better people we should not all pleasure all play all reading all writing should be about some moral purpose that was not the idea earlier the idea was that pleasure and play for their own sake are also a good thing and i think that idea is coming back now maybe in some ways but uh, so i'm interested in that world view which changed so drastically uh, in the late 19th century since you have worked on bengal you are of course aware of the tradition of having these uh, women women friendships very close friendships and they called each other shoi s a i yes. and they would give the names of flowers to yes. their friends and they would address each other always by that name and mm -hmm. this would often go down generations yeah Most female friendships are found like all over the country. They, there's called Guia and UP, and you know that sort of thing. And male friendships also found all over. But I think the acknowledgement that it has an erotic, it can have an erotic element. That is uh, not often acknowledged, and that is uh, found in this poetry, this Urdu poetry of the time, and maybe in other literatures too. I just haven't found it. So I found it in the Bengali 14th century onwards texts, and also in Urdu poetry in the 18th century. It's probably there in other places too. But yes, close friendship has always been a tradition and has been celebrated, as I said at the start. So is there in cinema too? So yeah. Subodha. See the chat box. Any other questions, observations? Uh, yeah, we have found that uh, Professor Shubha Mamin uh, he has uh, put forward a question that is it's to uh, Professor Vanita. Uh, Ma'am, how do you see the marriage of convenience in Indian context? So in marriage of convenience, I mean, I, it depends how you define that. So, in my book, Love's Right, I have a chapter on marriages of convenience. Uh, so, on uh, if you mean just an arranged marriage because you want to have children, that is of course an ancient institution, and I I have um, no problems with it. If the if the individuals concerned are happy with it and want to go that way, I think it's fine. Uh, and of course, it has been changing. Marriage has been changing over time. So now, in many cases, in arranged marriage, the couple meets before, then they start talking on the phone, then they start. Sending each other Valentine's Day cards. I know such couples, and so it's what I call arranged love and love, love. Uh, you know, uh, it's a way in which you can fall in love. As it's also one of the ways of falling in love. Um, so I don't think you can draw sharp lines between them. But another kind of marriage of convenience, which is not so simple. is where a person who is what we would call gay or lesbian decides to marry a person of the opposite sex just to please their family and that actually happens people actually advertise uh, for somebody like that and, and and that i think is also okay if they're okay with it but uh, if they both and they have certain rules between them 
But what is not good is when a homosexual person, a homosexual person marries, uh, marries a heterosexual one without telling them and is basically deceiving them and due to social pressure. But that is, of course, a problem because you, the, the other person will never be feel satisfied, will always know something is wrong, but won't know what is wrong. And the homosexual person will also be leading a double life and not be happy. So this is a very bad idea, but it happens due to social pressure and familial pressure because many families think, oh, if you think you are gay, but once you get married, you'll be fine. So that kind of marriage of convenience, I think, is a bad idea. So. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, there is another question. Uh, it's by Shanjib uh, Dev Sharma. He's asking that uh, the death is a kind of marriage. How? Will you elaborate this statement? In my book, Love's Right, I have argued that in the case of these couples, it can, came to me from these couples themselves. Uh, when they both straight and both uh, male-female couples, female-female and male-male, in many cases when they commit joint suicide, what they are trying to do is uh, say that they are married in death. If you won't allow us to be married in life, then we'll be married in death. We die to, like a Romeo and Juliet kind of a situation. And they, But with the addition of the idea of rebirth, that we will be married in the next life. So I have many of these suicide notes which came from uh, newspaper reports. And very often what they do is before committing joint suicide, they garland each other, they put sindoor on each other, and then they commit joint suicide. So they see death as the ultimate way to be united. And this again comes, I think, from literature. Uh, say you take the story of Heer and, Ran uh, Heer and Ranja, um, uh, they, where the two cannot, their families prevent them from being married in life. But when they die, then Varish Shah, the Punjabi poet who wrote of the story of Hira and Ranja, he says that their two souls ascended together to heaven. And so if they couldn't be together in this life, they are in heaven together. Okay, So that's a very old idea that death can be a kind of marriage when people are prevented from marrying in this life, then they are desperate. And they the only way they can unite is in death. Uh, so that's what I mean by death. So death can be seen by some people as a type of marriage. Um, Thank you, madam. Our uh, the teacher in charge of our college and the patron of this webinar, Dr. Gautam Shen, he wants to make an observation. So, Gautam, will you do it? Yes, uh, ma'am. Very much. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your deliberation. And what I want to say that uh, uh, I actually did my PhD on uh, Mahesatani's plays, and uh, during the early years of my writing my thesis, uh, your book, Same Sex Marriage in India. It came to my hands and it was like a Bible to me. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I also went through many of your writings. Uh, what I want to, uh, and whoever wants to uh, uh, do some work on same-sex love, uh, I, I think he, uh, he or she should, uh, you know, go through your book. Of, uh, it's, a, it's a must, you know. It's a must. It's a must, must reach. That is what I want to say. But uh, another thing I want to add to you is that uh, what Sukla ma'am was telling the, about the Soi, and uh, we also know the uh, words like Sukhi, Shakha, uh, regarding sensuous relationships. In, uh, in my childhood, I also came across one particular term that is Gongna Jol. Gongna Jol. Uh, Gongna Jol mm -hmm. is, yeah. uh, is uh, uh, yes, if, uh, perhaps you know it, and I also yeah. want to share this information with everybody present here. Is that it is a kind of friendship between two aged, uh, aged women. Mm -hmm. uh, aged women. Uh, they uh, meet suddenly, they go to some place where the Ganga uh, they go on a pilgrimage to a site where the Ganga flows beside, and they uh, take the oath, uh, taking uh, Ganga Jola and or, or the can water of the Ganges on, on, uh, in their hands, and they take mm -hmm. the oath of friendship, for lifelong mm -hmm. friendship. Mm -hmm. right? And they, there's a kind of lot of spiritual dimension between in these things, uh, in this kind of friendship. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. many people, who, 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 actually, I saw it in, in my own eyes, with my own eyes. And there is uh, this observation I'm making, you can go through uh, a, a data regarding it, you can have uh, your research through this, because I, I, I think that this uh, thing is very much uh, not celebrated in our uh, literature in the or It is not there, There's, and the terms, Soi, Shakha, Shoki, they are very much present in, you know, the research papers. But this thing, particularly Gong Majot, I think, this is not, I didn't ever came, uh, have come across this uh, particular term in any kind of research paper or any kind of writing. I, I mm -hmm. think you should concentrate on these newsletter writings. <laughs> it required to be class one of your students to take it on as research. And uh, I know that in UP, there is among younger women too and younger men going to the Ganga and making vows at the Ganga that is done. Mm -hmm. 
together of becoming a dharam bhai or dharam behan uh, exchanging uh, art, items of clothing i've written about this in my novel too exchanging turbans mm. exchanging orni exchange this is done to become brothers dharam bhai or dharam behan of course rakhi is a form of male female uh, yeah. as well you can establish but i found it in not ganga jal but in the 11th century katha sarit sagar which is a sanskrit text there is a term mm. there which i found only there which is swayamvara sakha and swayamvara sakhi which is a very mm. interesting joining of sakha and sakhi with the idea of swayamvara which literally means uh, self chosen right self choice so normally we hear swayamvara means a woman is choosing a husband but here it is joined with sakhi or sakha to mean this is the self chosen friend which is would which a man's male friend and a woman's female friend and again in that text too it is described as being connected to rebirth like uh, this woman says when i saw this other woman why did i feel so attracted to her it must be because we are connected from a free, uh, from a birth and with the two men also the yes, same yes, expression yes yes, yes yes that's the point yeah. yeah okay ma'am thank you very much okay thank you actually our this particular uh, session is getting live streamed in uh, youtube mm -hmm. and uh, there are around uh, 300 people who are watching it live and uh, they are really overwhelmed the live chat of youtube is getting thronged with the overwhelmed uh, messages uh, towards uh, it's basically thanks giving to you and all so mm -hmm. we are really thankful Thank uh, you, so Shukladi. Uh, would you like to uh, make some observation or comment? Yes, I would like to thank Professor Vanita first for a very illuminating talk, and there were things in our uh, lecture which uh, we were not even aware of. Uh, and uh, right. of course, we read these reports every day. But you see, the deeper bonding that you indicate that the friendship is marriage and marriage friendship at the very Yes, ideas of friendship and marriage and love, quote unquote, love, are re-examined in the way that you uh, look at these uh, uh, these incidents, the phenomena that is around you, that you are watching, that observe it and you are analyzing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So we are almost at the end of our uh, session. Uh, we. Uh, are especially thankful to uh, dr shukla banerji uh, she was initially our first speaker and uh, she presented her paper at the second and then we are having uh, our friend sudeshna mojumdar sudeshna's uh, paper was excellent it was on the memoir uh, regarding the partition and the things in bengal and then uh, professor vanita your paper is uh, so far uh, is most uh, having the most overwhelming uh, response from our participants so i think uh, this particular session has been a grand success and uh, it would not have been possible without the uh, venture taken up by uh, professor shukla basusen as uh, she has uh, presented uh, in spite of all her impediments she has uh, put a great effort and thank you shukladi for uh, taking the castle and uh, coordinating and chairing this particular session thank you shuddha shakta for making a part of your experience thank you very much for making a part of your experience thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you. shukladi so thank you everybody our uh, third session will be on tomorrow at 11 am so whoever are interested we will be sending the links please join us Uh, we will be having two more sessions and uh, we are coming to an end of this session so goodbye and good night to everybody good night see you tomorrow see you shukladi your paper is there tomorrow shukladi thank you everybody on behalf of the college